Good afternoon, everyone, and Facebook family. Ha happy uh, Friday as we kick off this week's masterclass. And I'm encouraging you to join us as we talk about government accounting systems, the importance of you understanding you, your government accounting system as you begin to enter into this space. Uh, I'm going to now let that my clients that are online in, and we're going to go ahead and kick kick off this today's session. I am so excited about this partnership with Ted Rose of Red Rose Financial Solutions. Um, he's been playing in this game as long as I have, and I'm practicing what I preach as I um, build out GPI and what I'm teaching you guys as you build out your business. The importance of teaming, the importance of collaborating, the importance of you understanding your accounting system. Your accounting system, and I would say that and your lawyer are the most two important people that any small businesses, I mean, all small businesses should have because that's the heart of the business. I'm going to continue to let people in. Um, good evening uh, to some of the GPI clients and some of the new potential clients that are coming in and joining us on the Zoom link. Um, again, I'm happy that you're able to take the time out and join us for this masterclass as we continue to um, impact, impact and empower communities. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to actually um, share my screen and talk about the upcoming activities that's happening with GPI. Um, again, I'm always about collaboration and you understanding the power of teaming and understanding it's important that we learn how to collaborate. So I encourage everyone to put your name in the chat feature, your business name, location, email, contact information, any certification. Are you looking for teaming partners? What's your background? It's all about collaboration. So it's important that you understand um, how we um, share and make sure that you collaborate. Um, I wanted to also update on what's going on. We have a free webinar uh, tomorrow where I'll break down the do's and don'ts of entering into government a con uh, 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 federal contract. It's at 9.30 a.m. Our next cohort actually will start next Thursday. So if you're interested in getting into this cohort and uh, beginning to understand the importance of collaboration, teaming, the process, please join me tomorrow. We also have... Um, We've also added additional services, which include coaching services of some of the experts that are in this area of, of government contracting. For more Paul, the volume has gone up. Thank you. Sorry, I, I clicked the wrong one. Um, I'm also excited about the partnership that we have with the National 8A Association. Um, please go to their website. Um, it's all about us partnering with other, bar, uh, uh, other businesses and you getting to know other individuals that are in this space. We also will be having a family reunion on um, July 23rd at Lake Spivey. 
It's time for all of the family to come together. Hopefully I'll get some government officials to participate um, and act as a small business industry day. Now that you all have worked for the last year and getting your certifications, getting your website, um, going through the process and winning contracts. It's important that we can begin to keep this community together. We're all now speaking the same language. Um, again, I've also written a book called That's Crazy. Recognize Crazy and Run. You can go to store.bookbaby.com store on Amazon um, or purchase it on Amazon. And it kind of journals some of the things that I went through in that first business. If you need information on the GPI community, please email me at info at gpiwin.com or you can contact us at this number. Shayla, can you please um, put this information in the chat feature? And Ted, if you'd like to add your information in the chat feature, that would be helpful as well, because I'm excited as I introduce today's master trainer. We're going to talk about uh, government accounting, choosing the right accountant. When should you expect the audit once you start winning your con contracts? And based on his level of expertise, what are some of the common challenges he finds with small businesses trying to enter into this space? So I'm going to um, bring Ted follow? on and Ted. Yes. Paula, I'm sorry. Um, could you reiterate? Um, I'm sorry, repeat what you said to put in the chat for me. Please uh, include the website and the email address or phone number for people to reach out. Okay, will do, uh-huh. All right, thank you. Ted, um, we should be able to go ahead and let's get the party started. I'm so happy that you joined us and want to impart on our community the importance of understanding your, your accounting system. So what I would like to do, if we could just start off and if you could share your experience as starting out as a small business, how did you get into this industry? Um, and just let's, let's hear about Ted Rose first and how he built Rose Financial Solutions. Great, thank you, Paula. And yeah, first off, I just wanna thank you for uh, having me, or inviting me to join your, uh, the community, I think, um, the more and more I've learned about uh, GPI, the more I've seen how uh, we have a common uh, core values and uh, a common approach to helping our clients succeed. So I'm just excited to be part of the community and to be able to give, you know, give back to the organizations that uh, you're already uh, supporting. And I think we have you know, very complementary uh, skills and capabilities. Um, so the, to get back to your your question about how it all began, um, it all, it, you know, I started my career at uh, Price Waterhouse as an auditor. I then uh, you know, left there and uh, went to work for a publicly traded biotech company. And as their controller, went back and got my MBA. And uh, while I was uh, finishing up my MBA, the, uh, the company's product, uh, the biotech company's product failed in the clinical trials. And so, uh, that organization downsized from you know 35 or so employees down to about six and um mm -hmm. you know i was asked to stick around to help uh, kind of wrap things up and to position them to to go and uh, go after another another product as and, and this is a good lesson in, in business i got early on was that um you know things don't always go in a straight line you know you know the first attempt at things don't, you know doesn't always work uh, but that organization actually is still still a client of ours uh you know 27 plus years later as they're uh, pursuing you know other 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 products as, as well and so you know, getting back to how rfs got started while we were going through this transition we started looking in the marketplace and and uh, they, they, they were a public company and uh, but they're you know they had scaled back their operations so they, they couldn't afford to have a full accounting department and function 
uh, but they still needed a sophisticated solution. Um, and that's really how RFS was founded. Because when I looked in the marketplace, public accounting firms didn't do operational accounting and uh, bookkeepers were not sophisticated enough to deal with the complexity. Mm -hmm. and, um, so that's, you know, we got started in 1994. Uh, we coined the term accounting outsourcing in 1995, mm -hmm. and uh, we started getting into the government contracting space a few years after that. <laughs> and because um, I started my first business in 96, and I will consistently say I admire accountants, but I don't like your job because I was forced <laughs> to be in accounting just starting out. So even you, when you started out just as a small business, um, was did you uh, were you a consultant? How did you go about marketing your business just as a small business and your services? So when I was just getting started, yeah, we I really started out as a as a consultant, and uh, you know I took pretty much any related project I could I could get early on. Um, you know I, I was able to secure a, an agreement with my prior employer. I think. Officially, I think they were my third client that actually signed up, uh, but I did have a couple other consulting projects and then you know, started to uh, you know, build up a revenue stream, providing that consulting, and then just continue to look around at, you know, how do I, how do, what do I call the service that I, I wanted to provide? Because uh, accounting outsourcing wasn't a term back then. Mm -hmm. and so I did find the term outsourcing when I was doing my research. And what we were doing was accounting, so I just kind of like peanut butter and chocolate and put those two together and uh, came up with accounting outsourcing, started um, uh, marketing that in the Washington Business Journal. So that's where we coined the term and uh, it caught on. And you know, within a year, other firms started to you know, join that advertising you know, category. And uh, we really started to find the, the product and, and build that up and, um, and ended up uh, you know, moving into office space uh, almost uh, almost a year after starting uh, starting the business. And you currently have how many on staff now? We have, a, have about 65 employees. Okay. That's, that's a lot. And you've been doing this for 25 years. And I guess when I um, I met you, I, I mean, why I was introduced to you was, again, through LinkedIn. LinkedIn is very a very good marketing tool. And that's how we ended up connecting. But when I saw your information, I knew, oh, that's exactly what our client base needs. Because most small businesses don't have a clue about accounting. Uh, because again, we start our business on their skill set. And I realized after that first million dollar contract in that first business, I was no longer um, running a business on my skill set. I had employees. I had 940s and 941s that I had no clue what it meant to. I was doing my own accounting until um, I made an error in my invoice. So I knew it was important that you could not have just Joe accountant in this space. So what do you recommend um, or how do you recommend small businesses start out um, if it's just a, a one person um, startup company trying to enter in this space and for me i think it's important that they make sure their accounting system is already established so that you don't have to go back because going back becomes a nightmare do you agree yeah i, I mean I, again i'm i'm a great uh proponent of uh Counting discipline, financial discipline for an organization, and I think those the habits that, that of that financial discipline. It's important to start it early, and uh, there, it's a lot of there's a lot of benefits um, as, if you operate your business checkbook as as a business. I think you you treat the treat the funds differently than you would your your personal funds, and it means segregating it and then creating you know that professional environment and that thought process. And I think it sets the tone for an organization early on. And so the, you know, the really nice thing about um, today as compared to um, you know, 20 plus years ago is that the, you know, getting, you know, getting started on accounting software is you know, very simple with a, a package like QuickBooks Online, uh, you know, very cost effective um, to, to get, you know, to 
get that purchased and get that uh, get that set up. Um, you know, obviously, if you're getting into the government contracting space, there's different configurations you'd want to consider in in setting that up, as opposed to maybe some of the the stock um, you know uh, configurations that come you know, out of the box, so to speak, with QuickBooks Online. But th th those you know, getting that set up and configured is relatively um, inexpensive as compared to what it used to be. And so it's something that I would rec highly recommend that uh, you know get set up on day one of an organization, so um, you have that information you know uh, at your fingertips and um, in a system as you move forward. And for me, um, I was sort of pushed early in the first business. Uh, we were using, um, I think, what was it, Peach Tree? Back yes. then, <laughs> like I'm, date, I'm dating myself, but um, the government was asking us uh, to that we needed a Dell Tech, the Dell Tech um, software. And based on the size that we were, I don't think that was a great investment right. because it cost me like $17,000. And then it took me six months to find someone to implement. And then it was another $2,500 a quarter for support. So um, are they a little bit more lenient now or are they still trying to push people even though they say they don't recommend one software over the other? Do they still, are they okay with QuickBooks as a um, software accounting system when it comes into a cl compliance? So I, I think the answer is um, yes, of course. Um, I, I don't think they, they, they push organizations into a specific software. I think if, when, you, when you look at BCAA or GovCon compliance, it's, uh, it's really about having you know, certain softwares, uh, but also the process um, and um, procedures that are being followed. Um, and, and so it's not just about the software, it's about that process and procedures. And so, and then having the people with the expertise to, to maintain it. So that's really that solution, that full solution is, is really what um, is required in order to be the DCAA or GovCon compliant and get through uh, the audits. And you know, based on the size of the organization, I think it's perfectly fine to be in a QuickBooks, you know, package on day one, and then as an organization grows, you know, they're, you know, uh, moving towards a, you know, a Dell Tech product is, you know, certainly one mm -hmm. of, you know, one of the systems you can move to. There are other systems mm -hmm. out there that, um, that have, uh, you know, come out, you know, since, since the, you know, the beginning days and the, you know, that we, were, <laughs> we started, uh, Dell Tech was certainly the, you know, really the only, uh, only product back in, you know, back in the day, but there are yeah. You know, I would say quality well, products that uh, organizations can look at, and we do work with a, a wide variety of uh, uh, systems that are really designed to help mm -hmm. with the compliance. Yeah, because um, for me, uh, uh, accounting is just as good as the person inputting the information. You know what I mean? <laughs> Regardless of what the system is, and if you don't have those policies and procedures in place then that's where you were in trouble. So where do you find um, startups and small businesses? Let's say someone um, that has maybe one to 20 employees, um, where, are, where are some of the challenges they have in beginning to understand this space? Because it's a whole different language, especially if you're, I was an event planner that became an accountant by default. <laughs> so what are the challenges or how would you recommend uh, outside of them, like, of course, bringing you on board and, and supporting them? What are some steps they need to stay, take? Well, I think you know, the first step is to get the uh, chart of accounts and the configuration of the accounting software you know, just set up um, early, you know, or as early as possible. So so that your your data is organized in a way that can support you in how you how you price and how you report information uh, to you know to the government and you know these types of um, you know basic techniques in the beginning will help to you know differentiate you from 
you know, other startup organizations that might not have their data in a certain format. And so by having the data in a, in a certain format, you'll be able to answer questions that are posed to you by, you know, by government contracting officers. And, um, and when you, uh, when you um, have the data in the, in the proper format, you can answer those questions quickly. You just gain credibility, you know, with mm -hmm. that um, contracting officer. Mm -hmm. um, so for, uh, for those who are just basics, you throw out an accounting term, <laughs> chart of accounts. Can we just break down what is a chart of account for those of us who have no idea about accounting and accounting software? Sure, sure. So the chart of accounts is um, it's, it's, it's like the backbone of, uh, of an accounting um, system. And it's the, the list of, of accounts that you have transactions flowing through. So the, you know, one of the, you know, the first accounts you would want to have transactions flowing through is your bank account, right? So that would be a cash account that would be on your chart of accounts. It would be cash and it would you know, be associated with that bank. And then you have you know, bills that you need to pay. Those would be your accounts payable. That's, that would be another chart of account would be the accounts payable. Um, and those first couple accounts are balance sheet accounts. So those are either an asset or a liability or part of the equity of, of a company. And then you have your revenue accounts. Like if you have income, you know, coming in, so you've sold something to the government, uh, you'd have, you know, set up your revenue accounts and then you'd have your direct expense uh, accounts, which would be um, the, the, the costs uh, associated with uh, generating that revenue. So if you, you know, build an hour to the government, you have an hour of you know, revenue coming in, and then you, you had to pay your employee an hour, the direct labor associated with that would be a direct expense. And so the chart of accounts is how you structure um, those accounts so that they make sense to the federal, federal government. So they have standards that you want, they want you to follow um, in separating out your direct and indirect costs, making sure you uh, don't have any unallowable expenses in, in those costs. And so that's the whole uh, process of setting up the, uh, you know, the system. Accounting system. And, and for me, again, coming from a layman's perspective, when I started out, I pretty much transferred what I did personally, but not really understanding accounting, meaning I knew I had a budget <laughs> and there was expenses associated with that budget. And then that was what was left over. Mm -hmm. Um, so And so often when you're applying for SBA's programs, um, especially the women's program or the 8A program, you have to provide those types of documents as part of the submission, mm -hmm. your profit and loss statement, uh, your balance sheet. But for someone who have no clue <laughs> um, how to even understand a profit and loss statement or balance sheet, what does that really mean? Sure. And for me, um, only thing I cared about was uh, meeting payroll. <laughs> and I just knew those parentheses at the end of that profit and loss shape, uh, statement wasn't a good thing, but not really understanding why was I having a loss because I was having money coming in. So just being able to break it down to just someone who don't have a clue about the accounting but need to have a clue about accounting because right. you're held accountable. Yeah. And I think the, you know, that's really where the, um, I think where the, where you separate out organizations that are, you know, serious about growth and serious about um, credibility as part of this process, the ones that, you know, have their system set up correctly, the ones that can create a balance sheet, create an income statement and a cash flow statement that reconcile and provide that to whether it be the SBA or to a financial institution to get to get a line of credit or to get you know funding. When you have those uh, documents you know uh, available, you have an increased credibility, and it it it, it shows. It's one of those things that's an unspoken um, understanding. So uh, when a, when a banker or when the SBA looks at a set of financials, you know they can tell if someone put those together themselves or they were put <laughs> yeah. together. Uh, by a professional, it, you know, it's uh, it's it, it, it becomes obvious. <laughs> yes, I saw a lot of them as I had the review uh, annual reviews in the eight day program, and even for the 
um, participants who are in that program, them understanding that based on your revenue level, SBA will require an audit or um, what was the other one that comes before the uh, audit? That's a remedial, what? I forget. <laughs> I haven't played in that space in a little bit. Accounting system review? Maybe. The review, a review. So there's various levels of audits once you start winning contracts that SBA will impose on that individual. Right. Um, and I have an, an example where I had um, a, a, a client who had, uh, at the end of the year, the government came and said, we have a contract that we want to award to uh, one of your firms. And we need to know, are they in DCA compliance? Right. I called the firm up. Yeah, we're in compliance. And it was for a bridge contract. It was a $3 million one year. <laughs> um, we, we accepted it on his behalf. And then when he negotiated with the government to do bi bimonthly invoices. So he was invoicing out of sync. After third month, the government came back and started looking at his invoices and put a stop work on that contract right. yep. because one, his system wasn't in compliance. Two, um, he had brought on a subcontractor that the government didn't know anything about and neither right. did we. <laughs> and so the government stopped paying him until he had his system in compliance. So he ended up spending about 30 or $40,000 bringing in a consultant to get his system in compliance. But um, at the same time, he still was obligated to pay the employees that he was. Uh, so have you had those kind of incidents? And I just, you know, I just know the importance of accounting. I may not know all the ins and out the nuances, but the importance of it is is critical. So the yeah, we've seen this time and time again throughout the years. Um, I could probably tell you uh, half a dozen stories about uh, contracts that uh, either uh, weren't awarded or maybe the award was delayed because they didn't get the accounting system up to up to speed in advance mm -hmm. of of the um, actually winning the engagement. So a lot of times that what the government will do if there's a, if it's a large, if it's the first large material a contract for an organization, they'll put the award on hold until they pass a DCA review or audit. And uh, if they can't pass it, then that, you know, you know, they could actually pull the award from an organization. And, you know, we've been, you know, we've worked with organizations that, um, waited until they were in that situation to think about cleaning up their accounting and you know, at the in, in the best case scenario they're delaying the, the that revenue from coming in because now they're you know the award's going to get pushed off a month two months three months but eventually what ends up happening is that the uh, contracting officer will uh, run out of time on holding that mm -hmm. award and uh, then they run the risk of actually losing the entire engagement as well mm -hmm. Um, and so is there, it, what is there a typical size um, when audits begin? Because there's various types of audits. You have a, a pre-award audit, you could have an initial audit or, or incurred submission. And these are all accounting terms that I learned in the business and was exposed to by default. <laughs> Um, is there a particular time when, or size of contracts? When would they call for audit on a contract or, or a pre-award audit? Yeah, so uh, I think each agency is a little bit, you know, a little bit different on that, um, but it's usually it's a multi-million dollar award and it would be for an organization that maybe hasn't had an award of that size before. But, uh, you know, again, you'd be looking at a multi-million dollar award, something that would be your, where your organization would be growing. It's kind of a make it or break it moment for an organization. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's a very stressful uh, time in general. And if you're, you know, have to also worry about whether your accounting system can pass at that time, if, you know, you, I think you've, you haven't put your uh, best fet, uh, foot forward 
um, with that initial, um, you know, that initial, initial engagement. So that's where we always recommend trying to get ahead of it, you know, and, you know, get a system, you know, set up early on, have it in compliance, maintain that compliance. And, um, and that doesn't mean you have to have, uh, have checked all the boxes for, you know, um, you know, for, for a 10 or $20 million organization, compliance is something that you can scale up as an organization grows. You know, the, as you do grow, you know, the, the requirements do uh, become more complex and, and more significant. And so you have to be, you know, continuing to up enhance your uh, level of compliance and, um, and the level of attention that you give it over time. Uh, but it's something that you should, you know, like, like I said earlier, you should start early on and begin that um, financial discipline mm -hmm. as early as possible. Yes. And for me, when I had to close that first business, um, I was hit with an uh, incurred cost submission. Mm. Uh, again, I already going through the stress of having to close the business and, and lay off employees. And now I'm hit with an audit <laughs> yeah. and with not really having the funds to support someone to come in and teach me or, or support that audit. But for me, in the end, I just provided all the documents and, pra and praise. <laughs> right. But <laughs> in the end, it worked out to my advantage because the government ended up owing me $85,000, even right. though I had closed the business. <laughs> so... Um, it, it doesn't this, always work that way. And so that, <laughs> <laughs> and that's, the, that's the importance of, uh, of really being on top of this because and I don't think a lot of contractors really understand this on day one, or when you're just getting into contracting, you may not be aware that, you know, under certain contract types, if, uh, if your rates or if, uh, your calculated rates are lower than what you've been paid for. Uh, and you do your uh, contract closeouts and incurred cost submissions, and th there's a possibility that you would need to refund money back. To the government. Yes. I mean, that's, your, that situation that you pot potentially were in. And uh, luckily, <laughs> as you did all the math, it worked out in your favor. Uh, but we, you know, we've worked with uh, companies that um, where that hasn't it hasn't been the case, and so the you know the key thing where companies can get themselves in trouble there is, and you may think that your, your rates are um, adequate, but if you have unallowable expenses that are in as part of your overhead or um, GNA rates, um, and it's determined to be um, uh, unallowable, then those amounts would uh, not be included in your rates. And then potentially you would have to uh, pay that, pay that back. <laughs> And I get this question often, and, and you're going to probably, because now we're both talking government language to audience that have no clue what indirect rates are and overhead. Um, at what stage, uh, um, well, I get uh, two questions. I get questions, I already have an existing business. Um, do I need to create a, a separate accounting system for government contracts? Mm -hmm. um, how do I merge the two? Do you have any recommendations for those types of businesses? So, yes, and, and really that depends upon the size of an organization. And so if it's, um, you know, if we're talking about an early stage organization, you know, we generally recommend just having one accounting system. Uh, we've helped companies that have been, let's just say, a hundred million dollar company getting involved or, or, or larger getting involved in the government contracting. Um, they're not quite ready to change their whole accounting process at that point. So that in that situation, it might make sense to you know, create a separate system to manage the government uh, you know, contracting area. And there's a lot of complexity associated with that. So that's why we don't necessarily recommend it for smaller organizations. And so the best way to describe it for a um, for a smaller organization um, is when you when you do federal contracting work, it's like being a little bit pregnant. Um, you're you know there's no such thing. You're mm -hmm. you're in it you know all the way. So for for a smaller organization, you need to really adapt to the government way of thinking about the business. Um, if that's going to be um, you know, if that's going to be an important revenue stream for you uh, going forward. And, and to me, 
it makes kind of sense how the government have you structure your accounting system because it's transparent. They know where the money is and you know where the money is. It's kind of itemized by line. So when we're talking about indirect rates, the government, when you're bidding on Pacific contracts, they require you to segment different areas of your business, Mm -hmm. overhead and G&A and fringe benefits. Those categories are called indirect rates. And for me, even playing in that field, um, as long as I did, it was still confusing because you're not quite sure, well, should this be in a G&A category or should this be in an overhead category? Is there a simplified way to just make it easier for people to understand the differentiator? Yeah, I think there's um, uh, certainly there's there's ways of, uh, I think, understanding you know, each of those three categories uh, pr- pretty easily. So a lot of times you would think about um, you know, fringe benefits would be you know, the benefits you pay your employees. And that's usually associated with direct labor. So that you know, the amount of uh, you know, labor or, or just labor in general would be associated with the labor that you're uh, paying your employees. So that's, that's usually how you would associate those two. So I, I would say that's the easier one. Where it gets a little little more tricky it would be the difference between a G&A and, a, and the overhead, for example. And there's a couple of different ways you can look at that, um, you know, that. But generally, um, a G&A would be really an expense that's administrative in nature. And it's um, something that's not, it's, a, it's an indirect expense. And so you, a lot of times it would be something like your, you know, your accounting expense or legal expense or your insurances that are, that are really just general expenses of the organization. And it's not really associated with one specific contract. Mm-hmm. And if you think about like the, the overhead rates, you think about those as being uh, things that are uh, maybe um, associated with multiple contracts, but are not attributable to one specific contract. And so you might think about um, if you had, you know, you know certain you know uh, workers that were working in a um, in an office, um, and you know, half of the half of them were working on contract X, and half of them were working on contracts contract B. Um, that yeah, that overhead you would be allocating between those two uh, two projects, and so that would be one you know one type of overhead. Uh, there's all sorts of different types of overheads and different types of rates that we could get into at a later date, but that's a, that's how I would uh, look at those in, in a nutshell. So, uh, so how do you determine um, one thing? Where does the salary? I mean, the salary of the owners go. Um, I used to split it between the two. I didn't really. I didn't. Under, someone told me to do it, and I did it. <laughs> I don't know if there's any logic behind it. <laughs> there's always logic behind it in, in <laughs> you know, the government contracting, you know, methodology. Uh, you know, we actually view it in in a lot of ways. Is is it's not just the best practice for government contracting. In a lot of ways, it's best practice just for accounting in 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 general. So, you know, we do use a lot of the um, government contracting methodologies with our commercial clients, uh, although we may name things a little bit differently for you know, commor- different types of businesses. Um, but the, uh, the the methodology for splitting up labor is is generally based upon timesheets. And so the important, important aspect is uh, when you're um, allocating labor, you have to have a basis for doing so. And then that, you know, the, the one, you know, one of the important systems to implement early on is going to be a DCA compliant time tracking system, um, and that it can be a manual system on day one. You know, but generally, we like to move a client to an, you know an automated or electronic time tracking system uh, relatively early in the process, so that it becomes easy or easier to allocate uh, labor. So that the owner is working on direct projects, and that time should be charged to direct projects. If if they're working just doing Kind of an administrative task for the business, then it would be an indirect um, expense. Mm-hmm. And how do again, if you start, I'm bidding on a contract. Is there a rule of thumb? I'm just starting out, 
and I want to submit my my bid, first bid on a, a RFQ, the, the low hanging fruit. Is there a rule of thumb that businesses should use to build in their time? How should how do you determine your salary if you're just starting a business and trying to factor it into your cost? So, you know, those are. There's a lot of different factors to weigh into that. So there's, um, you know, first of all, what are what's the market rate for uh, for your position? You know, generally for a startup, you know, the um, the mark the the ability to pay an owner is also going to be based upon uh, the revenue it generates and the cash that's that's available. So, um, and then you have to look at the the tax consequences as well. And so. When you kind of look at all those items, you know the you know the compensation for for an owner in, in the first year could you know, could be zero. I mean, it could you know it might not be might not be any compensation. But as that revenue grows and the compensation grows, then, you know you want to migrate your um, the compensation for the um, for the president and CEO you know to 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 a normalized amount based upon you know, an organization your size, making sure you can maintain cash flow for the organization and, uh, you know, making sure it, you know, meets a certain minimum, um, you know, minimum thresholds for tax purposes. That's another thing you have to keep in mind. But then ultimately, is it reasonable? Um, and then there's certain standards for government contracting that you would need to follow, um, which, you know, usually aren't an issue in the early stages, but can become an issue as a company uh, grows. I keep hearing that same message said it from the beginning. So you already can build on those standards. Right. Um, mm, interesting. So because I, I again, if I'm bidding and I just, again, pulled out numbers and sometimes I use it, but I, I try to tell people you're still trying to be competitive when you're be competing on that first bid. And we train them on how to do the market research to see what the history of that bid is. Mm -hmm. um, but you still want to put your cost in there. And it's important that you start thinking of yourself and putting some of your time and cost in that, those bids. Would you agree? Yep. And so, you know, again, I, when I was referring to zero compensation, I was really referring to like the startup phase where there's limited or no revenue coming in when, when you start to to go after larger contracts where you want to you know you're going to actually be participating in you know in the overhead and the direct mm -hmm. you do want to make sure you have a reasonable compensation for you know someone performing those activities of the organization and again if you're you know if you're doing direct work you know how much would you pay an employee that you hired you know, you know off the street to do that that would be a good indication of what your compensation should be if you're doing indirect work and maybe you're you know you're doing the the bookkeeping so how much would you pay a bookkeeper to do the bookkeeping work mm -hmm. and so that those are all become you know part of the standards of what compensation um you know you can justify and it's also you know starts to get you into this world of of um what we would call forward pricing so where mm -hmm. you're you're pricing ahead so you're saying uh, i'm going to per perform these services because it's a new contract and and maybe you, you you know you you're not part of any of the current contracts that you're working on, and if it's a new contract, you know here's what the compensation would be. I'm going to build that into my rate structure. I'm going to build that into my the hourly rates that I'm going to charge for this direct labor category. And then once I win that contract, then I'll be able to pay myself from either the direct uh, direct uh, labor categories or from the indirect um, as well. And would you say this is a profitable industry on this side? Do people make money? Uh, people can make a lot of money in government contracting, <laughs> especially if they do it correctly. <laughs> and, and, uh, and again, I, I, my concern was always, um, again, understanding when you're having partners, you have the same core values. And I was always nervous when some of the partners I was having was running their personal expenses through the business. Mm -hmm. um, have you run across? So have you run across owners and partnerships and, and 
those owners may, partners may have two different value systems um, as it relates to money. Do you run across that often? Sure, sure. I think that's um, that's a common thing in, in partnerships. It's important that you have people that are like-minded and with similar values on the partner side. Um, and I think the you know the key thing that we try to do you know with our clients is to help them understand where the line is. Okay, there's uh, you know there's a you know there's black and white areas and there's gray areas, and you know we want to you know we do want to keep our um, clients in in a position where they. It, they're, they're never going to be across that line. And so it's something that we're, we're very um, uh, clear about in what we provide our clients is that financial clarity. Uh, we never want our clients to find themselves in a, in a tough situation. And so we provide them with the guidance of where the line is and make sure that we can uh, keep them on, you know, on this side of the line you know, um, you know, going forward. Mm. Uh... I'm, I'm enjoying this. I hope the audience is, is, is enjoying this. Um, does anyone have any questions that you want to ask Ted? That you can open up your mic and um, ask a question? Anyone? Good morning, Ms. Paula and Mr. Rose. I do have a question. This is Marion Stephenson. Mm -hmm. um, in reference to, um, I'll give you an example. I'm dealing with the RFQ for a, what is it called? A um, speech therapist um, pathologist. It's under the category of SCA, which is not possible because SCA only covers occupational codes that are SLP assistance. Right. And how do I, so I know there are professionals and professions are not listed in SCA. So how do I deal with an issue like that as far as, um, when I submit my bid, do I have to explain that, you know, this is an issue and I can't give you the rate based on this code because they're not assistants, they're an actual, you know, licensed professional? How do I deal with that? So, you know, each, um, what I would tell you in, in our years of uh, working, helping our clients with proposals, we've, we've learned over time that there's, you know, there's um, different levels of, of understanding and, uh, and competency in, in, with, with contracting officers as well as with uh, uh, contractors. So, you know, there's uh, there, you no, know, neither side is perfect. In, in other words, like they don't always get it right when they are putting things together. There, you know, there are un unintended uh, issues that come up and, uh, you know, it's possible that you've uh, uncovered one of those. And so mm -hmm. I think it's a um, what we would always recommend in this situation is to uh, put um, put out a question on that. Uh, it, when if you have uh, you're still in the, the question and answer period, uh, you you want to put out a question and be um, you know and let them you know, do their research and they might come back and adjust uh, the you know the, the offering as, as such. Okay, so if it's past that stage of questions and answer, um, so when I submit the response, can I just state that this um, particular um, occupation is not is not listed? So they understand that I'm not inflating the rate just because, because that's obviously just going to risk for me losing a bid because it's very competitive. Sure. And if they're thinking, okay, this rate should be this based on occupation and whereas it's not listed, that would be my concern. Yeah. As a, you know, I could potentially lose a bid. Yeah, I, you know, again, um, have to probably look a little bit more details in, in, into. Um, have you reviewed all the all the Q and A coming in, and no one else has asked that No, question? no Q and A, <laughs> none. Um, and actually, as it has happened, it was an IHS bid. It went from economic, you know, Indian owned business and it shifted to total small business, like literally overnight. Mm -hmm. And now obviously it's past the question and answer stage. And I even tried to submit a question and I never received a response thus yeah. far. And it's due like next week. So it's like, I, yeah. I don't, I don't want to waste time submitting to something which I have no chance for. Cause that doesn't make sense to waste time like that. Sure. <laughs> I couldn't give you a direct answer on this specific uh, solicitation, I think, uh, but uh, you know, in my, you know, my experience, providing more information is always better than less and um, demonstrating your competency uh, could end up helping you win the engagement as opposed to causing you to lose it based on price. Okay, <laughs> great. And one more question, um, in reference to health and welfare benefits, I have a situation in which I have an employee. Um, so I know that for, we have provided insurances and 
um, retirement benefits and so forth. Mm -hmm. But this particular contract, um, first of all, we're getting only the four, 418 an hour. We have not even asked for it. Um, the contract was two years ago when it was 418 an hour, 418 an hour um, health and welfare. Now it's 423. So I'm a subcontractor for this contract. So we have not requested it, uh, an upgraded amount, however you want to say. In addition to that, the benefits that are being paid, it's more than the cost. So it's like 733 a month, approximately. We're paying 790 just for his um, health insurance. That includes medical, dental, um, insurance, or life insurance, and vision. That alone takes up that whole amount and additional. Sure. So how do I, if I, God forbid, we're audited, but how do we justify not paying into a retirement account? Or even a savings account, whereas we have no money, we're already paying sixty dollars over out of our mm. pocket. We're losing sixty dollars a month. Right. Uh, uh, you know, again, I think there's um, there's a lot of complexity in this area, and uh, again, I, I don't I don't know all the specifics about this um, uh, you know, this contract that you're involved with, but what we've seen that uh, organizations um, that support. Uh, these types of contracts is they'll, they'll sometimes just provide the, the cash benefit uh, for the net amount as opposed to trying to balance uh, the benefits and uh, that would be a way of just protecting yourself um, you know as as you know certain benefits start to you know increase and they don't keep up with the um, uh, with, with the amounts in the contract okay that's an excellent idea thank you <laughs> greatly appreciate that uh, uh, and and that's a whole nother world. I, I've only dealt with one or two contracts that dealt with the health and welfare. Can you kind of elaborate on what that is when you're winning those types of contracts that requires that? Are you asking me or? Yes, I'm asking you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So health, health and welfare. Uh, these are usually associated with like a service contract act type uh, type contract. And in those contracts, they may have um, a requirement that you provide and document a certain level of, of um, benefits. And so these, these are usually like lower um, dollar amounts. And so there may be, um, it could be entry level positions or uh, you know, lower dollar, uh, uh, dollar, uh, direct labor dollar um, um, types of engagements, and they just want to make sure that that there's a minimum amount of benefits that are associated with those with those contracts. And so, um, for those types of contracts, they they tend to be a lower dollar amount, lower margin, and then and they're 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 just requiring that these benefits be paid. And if it's not done the correct way, then I think the way uh, what Miriam was talking about is. Uh, you can end up in a loss situation um, if, uh, if, if, the, if you can't balance your uh, fringe benefits to the amount being paid. And which is interesting because I was working with a company and she'd had the contract for three years. And, I, and is that a contract requirement? Because she, she missed that part and she had to end up going back <laughs> And paying all those employees because she was not um, in compliance with that health and welfare. Yes, it's it that, be, that could occur. It's an expensive mm -hmm. miss um, if you miss that on the <laughs> agreement, and then you you know either didn't pay and didn't accrue those um, those expenses, or you know in Miriam's case, you have employees that are um, paid in a different scale and um, you know and benefits more than what you're getting reimbursed for. Mm. So how are you held liable? Again, if you're just a small business too, you know what I mean? That's why I say it's a, a gray area. <laughs> We're working in this space in the small business. Um, what are repercussions for not paying? Uh, they, they can make you pay, uh, you know, downstream. <laughs> and so those expense, you know, so those, those, you're, you know, when you sign up uh, on a contract, you're, uh, there are certain provisions that you're certifying and, and in, in these types of contracts, you're certifying that you will pay your employees based on that service contract act and based on the, those dollar amounts. And if you fail to do that, then they will compel you to make that up. Which is interesting. And for me, I think a lot of small business 
they get in, in trouble, especially as you start growing and you get in employees and you start mixing that payroll money with the regular money. And I realized because I went through six accountants and one of the accountants was not paying the payroll taxes. Mm. That's how I got involved with understanding 940s and 941s and the importance of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's important, again, you've got to, the government is entrusting you as a business owner. I think it's a public trust. Is that what they call it, uh, Ted? Yes. Um, when you, you're taking out people's... These are trust funds. And so um, yeah, these these funds... And, and, and the way I would describe it is when you withhold money from your employee's paycheck, are those, that's not your dollars. Those are not your dollars. So, you know, you've been entrusted to hold those funds and pass those along to the government. Um, other types of trust funds could be like a, a sales tax uh, where you're entrusted with those funds. Um, the Service Contract Act is something, something similar because, you know, you you've certified that you are going to remit those funds uh, to, to your employees. So, you know, when, when you, you want to take those, um, take that trust seriously, you want to maintain that trust and, um, you know, with your employees and uh, with the government. And um, if, if you do violate that trust, there are some serious consequences, including personal liabilities uh, that can be attributed to you. And, um, and then that is a situation, not a situation you want to be in, where the uh, government's coming after you for uh, trust funds. <laughs> yes, um, and and that was always my fear because again, the government was coming in. She hadn't paid the taxes, and we ended up owing them about eighty five thousand dollars when I started clearing her desk. Mm -hmm. So they were coming to our office to shut us down, <laughs> but we were able to work with the, the government, with the IRS. And so I think people are fearful of the IRS just because of the IRS, but I'm not fearful. They just don't want you to run from your debt. Right, right. <laughs> right, you know? <laughs> so a you know, funny story, um, you know, this was a funny story because it had a happy ending, but we had a, we had a client that um, was you know, a very good client of ours and then they were actually acquired. Um, and you know, we help companies go you know, grow and a lot of them eventually get acquired by larger companies, which is, a, you know, which is a success in, in our mind. But when this company was acquired, it, you know, they transferred their payroll um, to the acquiring company's uh, payroll ID. And, you know, the, the IRS was actually used to receiving um, a large dollar amount, you know, twice a month from that company. And on the, you know, on the day or you know, two or three days after the funds didn't come in because they were remitted by the, the acquirer, the IRS actually showed up. A guy you know, from the IRS showed up with a, with a gun you know, strapped to his, uh, to his waist to uh, find out what happened to uh, the large amount and to make sure that it was actually wasn't misappropriated. And, mm -hmm. and that was one of the, you know, it was the, it, the reason it's a funny story was because they were able to easily, we were able to easily answer the question and show them the records where, you know, the, the other company had paid, paid the taxes, but that's the, the level of uh, interest that the IRS has in, um, in, in trust funds. <laughs> and, and you can't blame, and you want them to, but again, cause that is our dollars. Um, and for me, I always also had to have the balance of, maintaining the unemployment rate mm -hmm. and not really understanding what that meant for me as a small business because my business started out as an event planning company which meant it was seasonal so i was having i was laying off people and i started out paying three percent and i ended up paying eleven percent so again these are all things that you don't have a clue about when you're starting out in these business um, would you agree? Yeah, I, I would say the, you know, the, the unemployment rate is the government's, uh, I think a lot of people uh, have the misconception that the government uh, pays for you know, uh, an employee's or an ex-employee's uh, unemployment. The government doesn't actually pay for it. You pay for it you know, the next year. <laughs> and so what they do is if you, if you have on, you know, an, an increase in 
employees applying for and receiving unemployment, then they increase your, your rates the next year and then they recoup that money later. So they, they do prepay it for you, but then they recollect it from you in future years. So that's an important expense to, to manage and um, to make sure you're following proper procedures on the HR side when you're, you know, if someone is uh, maybe not performing, you want to make sure you document that non-performance because um, as soon as you terminate them, they're going to potentially be applying for unemployment. And uh, if you don't have document documentation around, you know, why, you know, why you let them go, then they will be most likely receiving unemployment and you'll be paying them uh, in, in a year, you know, usually for about two to three years to pay it all back. Mm, yes, I, I realized that I went through a lot of unemployment hearings <laughs> and, and began to understand, understand the importance of HR. As right. I say, the attorney and your accountant, they go hand in hand. Yeah. So we are wrapping up, coming close to one o'clock. Um, I have time for one or two more questions. Does anyone have any other questions? No questions? Well, um, this was a great interview, Ted. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge, your wealth of knowledge, your experience. Ted and I will be, um, Ted and I will be coming together in the next week or two, I mean, in the next month or two, where we're going to be offering our clients a four-week training program on setting up your QuickBooks. Um, our program is all geared around a step-by-step, -step, um, but, and we want, we, I want to teach you how to fish. I don't want you to be dependent on me. And I came with Ted with that same philosophy and he agreed, um, but we're always going to be there for support. So we're working together to come up with some packages so that he can train you on how to um, set up your accounting system from the beginning. And as you grow, we all grow. It's all about building a community. So again, I thank everyone. Thank you, Ted. Everyone give Ted a hand. Was this a great interview? Did you all enjoy the interview? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. thank you. Thank you, God. And thank you, yes, guys. thank you. For yes. Thank you, Paul. So, look Thank out, you. look out for the um, next um, phase of how we roll out. For those of you who have completed our program and look, looking uh, for that support, we'll be sharing more information. All right, happy Friday, everyone. Happy Friday. Thank you again, Friday. Paul. All right. Bye bye.